Mantor Ministries presents the Mantor Guy Podcast. We may talk about football. We could mention bacon. We might reference Rocky movies. We'll probably discuss the Mantor conferences, but we'll definitely talk about how to grow in our walk with God. Here's your host, the Mantor Guy, Jamie Holden. Welcome back to the Mantra Guy Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Holden. Thanks so much for joining us this week. On this week's podcast, we want to share with you a message from the Pendo Potomac 360 Man Conference in which Pastor Mike Santiago brought an inspirational word to the men about where we need to be getting our identity as men. It was such a relevant challenge for men in today's culture, so we want to give you a chance to hear this powerful message once again. So enjoy this message by Mike Santiago from the 360 Man Conference. So grateful to be here this afternoon. Thank you for staying. Everyone that left after lunch is not going to heaven. So uh, grateful to be here. So honored. I asked the Lord to give me a manly message. I'm like, God, I want a warrior spirit, red meat message. Give me something about arrows and spears and warriors and fighting and blood. And give me a word about circumcision. Give me something, God, at this men's conference, you know. It's, it's in the Bible. It's like, I, I really wanted so, I really wanted a manly message, man. Like, put some chest hair on these guys. Let's do this thing, you know? And he led me to John chapter 4, which is the woman at the well, which is so weird. <laughs> but sometimes when God speaks, you just have to be obedient. And you have to do exactly what he says. And I think that this sermon will hopefully help somebody. John chapter 4. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard what he, that he was baptizing and making this more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself did not baptize them, his disciples did. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you should be baptizing people in water as well. Don't leave all the good work for your pastor, serve him. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to us, the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus tired from a long walk sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to get some Chick-fil-A. The woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said, she said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. So not only am I a woman that you shouldn't be interacting with, I'm a woman from a background that you shouldn't be acting with. Why are you asking me for a drink? And Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And then she gets very practical because she doesn't know what Jesus is saying, but sir, You don't have a rope or a bucket. As if Jesus needs those things. She said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Where would you get this living water? I wanna end this conference today talking about where we can find water that never runs dry, a well that never runs dry. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We're so grateful for your presence. Use your word. Use our time together today. I pray that it would be a gift. It would be a gift of community and of the spirit for us to gather together as men. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. I've come to the conclusion uh, lately. um, You've never seen your own face You've never seen your own, think about that for a second. I have seen your face more than you've seen your face. Kind of weird to think about. You've only ever seen a picture of you or a reflection of you. You've actually never seen you. I've actually seen you more than you've seen you. Unless you have this incredible ability to pluck your own eyes out and to turn them around and to face them towards your own face, you would only be able to see one eye of yourself, but you've never seen you before. 
I've never seen me before. I've actually seen you more than I've seen me. Weird, huh? I, I actually, in the little time that we've known each other over the past eight minutes or so, you've actually seen me more than I've seen me. I've seen you more than you've seen you. And this woman is caught in the same conundrum, in the same predicament, in the same intersection, in the same problem. She doesn't know who she is. And we don't know who we are because we've never really seen ourselves. We've never really gotten to know who we really are in Christ. We only know ourselves through the lenses of the words that were spoken over us by our Father. You only know what your ex-wife talked about you. Some of you are like, yep, that's true. You only know yourself by the upbringing that you had in the streets. You only know yourself by the condition upon which you live in right now. Many of us live our entire lives without ever knowing ourselves. We've never seen ourselves. And I have come for every single heart in this room today that struggles with understanding who they really are. We walk into a room like this. Mm. What's up, dude? God bless you, brother. How much you lift. How much you make. How loud is your motorcycle? How lengthy is your beard? We don't know who we are. We tend to fall in love with the perceived version of ourselves. We tend to hate our own perceived version of ourselves as well. We've all been there before. We've all had those days where we looked at ourselves at the end of the day and we said, that's not me. That's not who I am. Why did I do that? Why have I fallen subject to that old addiction over and over and over again? That's not who I am. And you come into a room like this. And God is dismantling the perceived version of yourself and he is reintroducing you to the real you that you're called to be. He's meeting you at the well at the noon hour and saying, you are not who they said you were. You are not who you think you are. You are not the mistakes that you made and you are not the things that you have accumulated. You are a son of God. And you get here to this intersection with Jesus and you're like this woman who's like, well, where is your rope and where is your bucket? There's so much pressure, our resume, our record, our sales. And what happens is we tend to cling to the things that we are proud of even when we have things that, when we, that we are ashamed of. The first question that frames up this reality we look through ourselves in what we do. So the first question we always ask someone when we meet them is, what do you do? What do you do? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever been asked that question? It's usually the first question. One of the, what's your name and what do you do? This is a question that tends to assign value to us or devalue us. What do you do? I'm unemployed. Hmm. What do you do? Oh, I'm the hedge fund manager at this big fancy bank. Ooh, sounds fancy. We tend to ask people what they do and then we tend to get our identity from what we do. Am I right or am I wrong? You get some guys in a room, it's all about what you do. You get some guys on the golf course, it's all about what we do. It's never about who we are. <laughs> it's always about what we do. And we tend to ask ourselves, and this is the question that frequently shapes our jaded identity. What do you do? And what we do is a gift. That's a gift from God. And gifts are possessive, protective, and proud. We tend to cling to our gifts that we are proud of when we have things that we are ashamed of. 
our resume, our sales, our record, our degrees, uh, how, how much we have made, how much land we own, how big of a deer we shot last year, how big was the fish, What we do is our gift. This is the one thing we have. And this woman is at the well. She has one thing. She has a gift. She's got one thing she thinks that Jesus doesn't have. And she lets him know. She says, sir, where's your bucket? Where's your rope? She's talking to Jesus. She thinks she's got one on Jesus. She thinks she's got something Jesus doesn't have. And many of you think you've done something in spite of Jesus. In spite of Jesus, I got this degree. In spite of Jesus, I started this company. And you got your bucket, and it's all she really has. She's poor. She's an outcast. She has a a history, as we're going to learn in just a little bit. And all she has is the bucket. And she tries to convince herself that she could live life without Jesus. And that she's doing Jesus a favor with her gift. She tries to convince that, that she, she's good enough to accomplish the thing that he can't accomplish. She doesn't know that she's talking to someone who literally takes water and turns it into wine. She doesn't know that she's talking to someone who literally steps onto water and makes it a steady floor and a foundation for him. She, she, she doesn't know that she's talking with someone who acts, acts at, the pool, at the pool of Bethesda, says, you don't need that bubbling water. I'm going to heal you without it. And, he, and here she is. No, no, no. I got my bucket, and you don't have one. So where are you going to get this water from, sir? This well is deep, and you don't have a rope, and you don't have a bucket. How many of you have tried to live your life without Jesus before? Trying to convince him that your gift got you here. That your gift, that what I have and you don't have got me here. We walk into a room and we, all we do is present our gift. We introduce ourselves by what we have and what we do. All we do, right now you're seeing me in my gift. You don't know me. You haven't, you haven't, you haven't seen the way that I talk to my children when no one else is around and they act up. You're getting presented with the bucket that has been given to me but not the real me, right? You've been there before. And so many of us are successful that we've tethered ourselves to our gift instead of tethering ourselves to our identity in Christ. So we, instead we walk out proud of what we've accomplished, proud of the bucket that we have to offer Jesus without ever knowing who we really are, knowing what he's really called us to, and knowing how to introduce ourselves properly. We introduce ourselves based upon our successes because we have so many failures that we're ashamed of. And we only present to the world this perceived reality that I've got the goods, I can make it happen. Oh, holla at your boy, I got everything I need. And what has happened in the men of America is we've been presenting this perceived version of ourselves and Jesus is trying to cut through that stuff and to get to who you really are. He wants to get to who you really are. He doesn't want you just to introduce yourself based on your successes. He doesn't want you just to hide your failures. He wants you to get to a real place where you have a real relationship with him. Genuine relationship with him. Your gift is on loan from God. Your gift begins to cloud your identity and you think that you can just do all of this on your own. There's so much pressure in failure, but there's even more pressure in success. We cling to the things that we have, we're proud of when we have things that we are ashamed of. She could only see herself through the image of her gift it says in verse 12 and besides do you think you're greater than ancestor jacob who gave us this well remember she's talking to jesus do you think you're greater than the guy that could dig this well how can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed jesus replied anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again 
But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water and then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband. Jesus doesn't even acknowledge her need for water. He acknowledges her need for redemption. He says, I'm not even going to deal with water. First, he doesn't even answer her. He just says, go and get your husband, Jesus told her. Verse 17, she has an honest moment. Finally, someone being honest with Jesus, not trying just to present this false reality of who they think that, that Jesus wants them to be, but instead she tells, her, she tells him the truth. I don't have a husband, a woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. You aren't even married to the man you're living with right now. You have certainly spoken the truth. So if the first question that we ask that we tend to see ourselves through is, what do you do? The second question that we tend to frame up our reality is, what have you done? What have you done? This is not your gift, but this is your guilt. Some of you can only see yourself through your past. You can only see yourself through your pornography addiction. You can only see yourself through your last couple of relationships. You can only see yourselves through your dropping out of school. You can only see yourself through how your father spoke to you here on earth. And I came for every single broken heart today to let you know that God is able not just to handle your success, but to also handle your failure. He is the God of both your gift and your guilt. <laughs> uh, I don't have a husband. You're right. And the man you're living with now is not even your husband. You've had five. But he doesn't say this to condemn her. He says this to redeem her. And I know that many of you probably grew up in households where your father only spoke poorly of you, spoke negatively over you, made sure that, that he, was, he was always the, the man in charge. And I came to let you know that you are not your guilt. You're not your past mistakes. God can handle your guilt. God can handle the failure that you feel. God can handle the disappointment that you feel like you've let somebody down. God can handle that today. Many of us walk around, many men walk around either in their successes or in their failures, but they never find out who they are in Jesus. I want you to find out who you really are in Jesus today. So that's, Jesus came to handle our guilt. Jesus shows up in the middle of our guilt. And the cycle of guilt is this, you start blaming others. You've been there before. Oh, Oh, it's their problem. It's if, if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for them, if it wasn't for them. And you get bitter. You get angry every time. <sighs> and then it spirals down. How do I deal with this guilt that I feel, Pastor Mike? I'm so glad you asked. You need to learn. All right, I need to learn. I'm learning. I'm learning to deal with this guilt. I've got a father wound the size of Texas in my soul, and I need to fix this father wound. My dad spoke over me. My dad abandoned me, and I tend to have this same spiral. You need to learn to forgive. Some of you need to know that forgiveness is not for the other person, it's for you. The unforgiveness spirit that sometimes wells up in a man like myself, where we want to prove people right, we want to prove people wrong, we want to, we want to be, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll forgive them when they apologize. That's not how forgiveness works. Because if that's how forgiveness works, then Christ would have waited a long time to die on the cross for you and me. He'd still be waiting. He'd still be waiting to die on the cross. You know that, right? That God pre-decided to forgive you and I before we were ever even born, he, was, he died on the cross. Even while on the cross, in the middle of dying, while he was dying, died, is bleeding. On the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Like in the act, he forgives them in present tense. How powerful is God's forgiveness? That would be like you coming up to me, taking off these overpriced shoes, and me telling you while you're taking them off my feet, I forgive you. 
You're stealing from me, but I forgive you. It would be like me walking into my house, finding someone going through my safe and saying, I forgive you. Caught in the act, Jesus forgave us. What a good God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. And when we accept that forgiveness, come on. We can then be reintroduced to who we really are. But many of you have built up unforgiveness towards others. And it's keeping you from God's call on your life. And I want you to receive an audacious call. A call to lead your families well. A call to lead your businesses well. A call to do your job with all integrity and character. And forgiveness needs to be at the forefront of that transaction. Then you need to move on. When your identity is wrapped up in your guilt, you only rob your present. You not only rob your present, but you drown your future in the quicksand of your memories. Some of you can't move forward because you're so busy thinking about the past. I release you from that in Jesus' name. You are not who your father said you were. You are not who this world says you have to be. You are a child of God. I, want you, I don't want you to drown in the quicksand of your memories thinking that I could go forward, but I did so much in my past. Pastor, if you only knew the mess that I've gotten myself in in my past, it's the past. Move forward in Jesus' name. He says, go and get your husband. I don't have a husband. Good. Because I'm not here to deal with your past anymore. I'm here to set you on a trajectory for your future. A call of God, that a mantle on your shoulders that is so great. It's so intense that when you walk into a room, you don't have to be defined by who you are or what you do or what you've done. Instead, you can see yourself as the child of God that he created you to be. Come on, let's give God some praise. Who you used to be can sometimes be your greatest enemy. Who you used to be can sometimes be your greatest enemy. I, 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 uh, I grew up in church. I'm third generation Assemblies of God, okay? I'm third generation Assemblies of God. If you don't know what the Assemblies of God is, it's our network of churches, you know? Like, I grew up, we, we spoke in tongues over our McDonald's drive through you know? I, I grew up in an era where you had church on Sunday night, all right, y'all got church on Sunday night? Not as much anymore. And you came on Sunday night and the preacher pushed you over. His tie comes off, his suit coat came off, and he pushed you over. If you weren't going to fall, he was going to make sure you were going to fall. You been to that church before? And then there's an old church lady, she'd come through, and she had a little, uh, we call them courtesy blankets. I don't know what y'all call them, but basically make sure that your belly doesn't show. When you, do y'all know what I'm talking about? I grew up Pentecostal, like real Pentecostal. If you don't know, it's, it's fine. And I remember there was a very, very clear moment where I was rebelling against my parents. Maybe you, you were here. I was like 14 or 15 years old. And I remember this really defining moment, a Kairos moment, where the intersection of, of what God's call was on my life and the intersection of what I knew he had called me to do. And, and the, like, the, the tension between my rebellion and his redemption was like coming to a close. And I, I grew up as a missionary kid in Europe. And in Europe, they got street vendors. Y'all ever seen street vendors before? This guy would come to you in the street, he'd open up his coat, and he'd have DVDs, bootleg DVDs. Like movies that were in the theaters, you could get them on DVD. And this is, if you don't know what, it, y'all the young people that don't know what a DVD is, a DVD is this circle thing, put it into a DVD player. You know what a DVD is? It's kind of like a video game, but like video. And so he'd open up, the, he'd, open, he'd say, hey, I got all these DVDs that are in the movie there. I'm like, well, this is pretty cool. And then he, he, he'd say, on this side, I have, uh, you know, age-restricted bad stuff on the left side of the coat. And I said, I don't want the left side of the coat. But I'm interested in this one movie that I knew my parents wouldn't let me watch. And I, but I really wanted to see it. So I had five euros, and I bought this DVD. And you're going to think this is kind of dumb, and I'm not even going to tell you what the movie is, because you'd be like, that's a good movie, Pastor. It, it wasn't about the movie. It was about the rebellion I was living in. Sometimes it's not about the act, the act that you're doing. It's about the spirit in which you're doing it. Right? Like, it's not a bad thing to, 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 to go to the movie theater, dude, but it was, it, was, it was against my parents' wishes. And so I bought this DVD, and I had a little portable DVD player. Do y'all, know, y'all remember those portable DVD players? 
It's almost like a micro laptop. This is before iPods and downloadable movies and Netflix and all this. So this is when you had to buy physical copies of stuff, you know? And I would watch that movie, and I, I love that movie. It was so cool. It was, it was like I, it almost made the movie better knowing that my parents didn't know I had it, you know? You ever been there before? In, in the height of my rebellion, I'm watching this movie, Rated R, and it's so bootleg, I could see people walking in front of the screen because the guy had filmed it with his handy cam in the movie theater. If you've never seen a bootleg DVD, you have no idea what I'm talking about, but they would go in there and film it. And I knew that it was wrong. I knew it. I had been raised right. I knew, but it just brought me, it brought my flesh so much satisfaction for this moment in time. And I knew that in order for me to move forward, I had to break that off my life. And I can clearly remember God speaking to me. And and he said, break the DVD. And I like had this argument with God. I don't want to break the DVD. You know, I grew up where you had like burnings of, you know, cassette tapes that you shouldn't be listening to and all the Pearl Jam and stuff like that that you brought to the altar at camps and things like that. And it was like in my room by myself having this DVD burning that I needed to have. And I, I could still hear the sound of the plastic cracking. I could still hear the sound of this addiction that I had to rebellion. I wasn't addicted to, to much, but I was addicted to rebellion. I had pride in my heart, which ultimately is the source sin for any surface level symptom that you are currently suffering with. You don't really have a pornography problem. You have a pride problem. You don't really have a stealing problem. You have a pride problem because you're inserting yourself above God's will for your life. You think you can do it without God. So I had this moment, this this Kairos moment, a call of God, and I broke this DVD. And I broke down crying in my room, no altar call, no piano, no lights, no camera, no microphone, no evangelist. Just a moment where I said, God, if you're gonna use me in my future, I must get over my past. Some of you in this room today, you need to have a Kairos moment where you no longer allow your past to dictate your future. You no longer allow your addiction to keep you bound on what God wants to do in your future. You need to break whatever bootleg DVD is in your spirit. And you need to say, God, I'm not gonna allow my guilt to be the lens upon which I live. I'm going to allow you to define who I am. Guys, we'll be right back with more of this message right after a quick break. I know you're going to dig this. Like what you're hearing? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thanks. Gentlemen, start your engine. The 2022 Initiative Man Tours are coming up fast. You need to plan to be at your local mentor conference as we ask the important question, will you ride or die with God? Featuring manly worship, challenging messages, and a chance to respond to God's challenge, the Ignition Mantle Conference is the shot in the arm that you and your church's men need. For conference dates, locations, and speaker information, visit mantorministries.com today. Make sure you're at your 2022 local mantle conference and bring as many men with you as possible. We'll see you there. For mantle conference dates and locations, visit mantorministries.com. Yep, you're listening to the Mantor, mantor Guy Podcast. podcast. Will you be a ride-or-die man of God? This is the challenge contained in the pages of our new book for men. Ride or Die examines the lives of 10 men who set an amazing example of extreme loyalty to God. No matter what he asked or what circumstances they faced, they always fist-pumped and said, Let's do this. I'll ride or die with you. Each chapter challenges us to follow in their footsteps and accept the call to be men who are wholeheartedly devoted to God. Filled with practical applications for today's culture, this book will inspire you to say, I'll ride or die with God. Order your copy today at mantorministries.com. Don't forget to visit iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thanks. Will you ride or die with God's word? Join the ride to take part in this year-long Bible reading plan designed to help you become a strong, on-fire, ride-or-die man of God. The 365-day ride-or-die Bible plan features 52 devotionals from pastors, speakers, and men's leaders, six days of Bible reading, and a devotional on the seventh day. 
It has relevant topics for men to aid in your spiritual growth. It also features a verse of the day and hand-selected Bible passages to keep you engaged all year long. This year, you can join the Ride or Die Bible Plan two ways. You can receive it for free via email beginning January 1st, 2022, or for the first time ever, we have made our year-long Bible plan available in a paperback version that you can purchase to have a physical copy. To join this Bible plan, visit mantorministries.com slash Bible plan. Guys, take advantage of this year-long Bible reading plan, become a part of it, and become a man of the Word. Order your copy today at mantorministries.com. Welcome back to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Welcome back as we continue this powerful word from Mike Santiago from the 360 Man Conference. In Jesus' name. So this is what she does. This is amazing. Verse 28 says, the woman left her water jar beside the well. Did you, have you ever noticed that before? The one thing she had that Jesus didn't have, she doesn't even go back to town with. Like the one thing she came for was for water. She didn't get any water. She leaves her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So people came streaming in from the village to see him so free. She was so free from her identity that she no longer needed the bucket that was attached to her when she got there. I want you to be so free to live a life so dangerous for the kingdom that you don't have to prove yourself to anyone else but to God that you could detach yourself from how much money you make. You could detach yourself from the degree that you carry or the business that you started. And you can say, I am a son of God, period, end of story. Pure, holy, righteous, set apart. I don't need a bucket to define me. The thing that she owned also was the thing that owned her and she left it at the well. She left it at the well. You can enjoy your gift that you are borrowing, and you could still be someone that is gifted and talented without attaching and tethering your own identity to it. It's possible for you to be successful, but not let that success define who you are. It's possible for you to be a great father and not let how much money you make be the contingency plan that you need to prove to your family that you're doing good and trying hard. You can have a bucket without being attached to it. So what are we called to? If I'm not my gift and I'm not my guilt, I'm so glad you came, Pastor Mike, all the way from Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm so glad you came tonight. What, what, What am I here for? If I'm not the gift that God has given me and I'm not the guilt that my father spoke over me as a child, then what am I? Who am I? Let me reintroduce you to you. In Galatians 3.26, it says, so that in Christ, you are all children through faith. I have a whole list. You are a child of God. You are a friend of God, according to John 15.15. You are a new creation, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Corinthians 6.19. You are God's masterpiece, according to Ephesians 2.10. You are purified in Christ, according to 1 John 1.9. You are made in the image of God, according to Ephesians. 424. You are alive in Christ. Let me reintroduce you to you because you've never met the real you. You are a citizen of heaven according to Philippians 320. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit according to Acts 1-8 as the band begins to come. You are a disciple maker, Matthew 28-19. You are the salt of the earth, Matthew 5-13. You are the light of the world, Matthew 5-14. You are forgiven and free according to Romans 5-8. You are not what you do and you are not what you've done. You are a child of God, a son of the most high God. The creator of the universe knows who you are. He not only knows who you are, but he's numbered the hairs on your head. Do you know what that means when someone numbers the hairs on your head? It doesn't mean he knows how many hairs you have. It means that if you were to pluck one hair out, he would know which number hair that was. That was number 7,486. That's how powerful our God is. He doesn't just count the hairs, he has them numbered. For some of you, it's easier on God than others. And I'm headed your way, okay? I'm heading your way, making it easier on God every time I comb my hair, I'm like looking at the comb, I'm like, I made it easier on God today. 
You are not what you do, and you are not what you've done. You are not the bucket that you brought to the well, and you are not the five husbands that you used to have. It's essentially what Jesus told this woman. You are a child of God. Detach yourself from your success for a minute. Detach yourself from your past for a minute. And just be confident in who you are. If we could have a church full of men, a district full of men, who were not attached to the bucket that God gave them or attached to the things that they did before they found Christ, you would find the most genuine, real men in all of the Potomac and Pendel district. You would find men confident in who they are without being arrogant in what they do. So I, I love you. I'm grateful for you. But your affirmation is not why I'm here today. I'm not here based on what you are affirming in me or not. I love the amens, I love the hallelujahs, don't get me wrong, but that's not why I came here today. I came here on an assignment from God. So if I'm making God happy, I don't care about anybody else. If I, if I, if I know that I'm obedient to the will of God, then I'm, I'm able to submit and to surrender to his will and to his ways. If you want to spice things up in your marriage, just get, detach yourself from your gift and detach yourself from your guilt and walk in back to your home confident in who God has called you to be. I dare you to pray out loud with your wife. I dare you. I dare you to say something out loud about what God did. How was the retreat? Uh, uh. That's what the response that they're expecting. Uh, uh. It's good. Uh. Where's the remote? What's for dinner? I dare you to pray out loud with your wife. Wow, watch what happens. Not like over your food. Thank you for this food, Lord, amen. I'm talking about looking at your wife right in the eye and say, you are a gift from God to me. I wanna renew these vows that I spoke over you and with you many years ago, and I don't want this thing to grow stale or, or dry. I wanna make sure that this thing is Jesus involved. Uh, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. When you involve the third strand, my friends, I dare you, I dare you, I just dare you. That's not even part of my message. That was free, that one's free. I close with this story. Have you ever seen uh, Extreme Home Makeover? I don't know if it's still in circulation or not. Maybe you can find the DVD, bootleg DVD somewhere. It's a great, it's a great show. Hey, it's Ty Pennington here. Welcome to Extreme Home Makeover. We're about to take this person's house and completely demolish it and rebuild it in one week. It's like a mission strip for volunteers all wearing the same shirt, you know? You've seen the show, right? It's a pretty cool show. If you haven't seen the show before, basically uh, there's a community member in need. Maybe they have like, a, they need wheelchair access built into their home. They need a wider hallway or they've been really impactful in the community, but their house is maybe falling apart. There's issues with their house. And so they, they pick a family. They send the family to Disney World for the week. And while the family's at Disney World, they uh, assemble a group of volunteers and construction workers and they, yeah, y'all seen the show, right? I, I'm just catching the kids up because they might not have seen it before. It's very cool. They send the kids to Disney World and Ty Pennington is the host and, and they're starting to demolish the house and then they start to renovate the house and they want to keep the family in mind. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll FaceTime call the family while they're at Disney World and they'll talk to the kids. Have you seen this show before? Just nod your heads. I know it's after lunch. I got the nap time session. It's all good. I'm gonna, I'll handle it. Up there in the balcony, they're like laying out on the pews. They're like asleep completely. They're like, I'm not sitting in those seats. I'm laying out on the pews, slain in the spirit, praise God. No, sir, that's the Chick-fil-A and the sweet tea that you just drank. That's not the, that's not the, I'm just kidding. So Ty Pennington will, will, uh, will FaceTime with the kid. He'll be like, hey, Johnny, how's it going? Good, Ty, how's everything going? Good. I heard you like to play electric guitar. Yeah, I love to play electric guitar. He's like, well, guess what? I got Bon Jovi right here, you know? And like he turns the camera and Bon Jovi's in this kid's room. He's like, we're gonna make it an electric guitar themed room. 
And he's like, yeah, and Bon Jovi's there. He's like, we're gonna call it, you know, living on a prayer room or whatever it's called. Like, we're gonna, we're gonna make your room all about electric guitars. Like, yeah, you know? Then like the next day they called the daughter. It's like, hey, Sally, how's it going? Are you enjoying Disney World? She's like, yeah, I love Disney World. It's so awesome. Like, I heard you like the movie Frozen. She's like, yeah, I love the movie Frozen. It's great. He's like, well, guess what? We made your room out of icicles. It's an igloo room real eyes, you know? Oh my gosh, thank you so much. And they've demolished this house in one week and they've rebuilt it in one week. And the whole thing crescendos at the very end. Everyone's wearing the same shirt. All the volunteers are out there. The crane camera is like sweeping over the crowd and they roll in with this big bus. Have you seen this show before? Rolling the big bus and like, move, the ah, bus, you see that, boy? you know, they come in, they, they bring the bus in and the bus, is in between the family and the house. So the people get off of the bus, but they kill, still can't see their house. So at the end, they start this chant. You remember this chant? It goes like, move that bus, move that bus, move that bus, move that bus. And then all of a sudden, there's a commercial break. And it sucks so bad. I want to see the house. I don't want to see a Taco Bell commercial right now. I don't want to see a Geico commercial right now. I want to see the house, you know? They come back in, swooping shot. All the product placement is perfect. You know, this is sponsored by Kenmore and Home Depot and all these things. They get on the opposite side of the bus. It's like, you know, they're chanting, move that bus, move that bus. Let's do it one time. Move that bus. Move that bus, move that bus. And then all of a sudden, they move the bus. What's the first camera shot after they move that bus? What's the first camera shot? Why are you showing me the faces of people that I've seen the entire show? Why are you showing me the faces of people that I've already seen? What are they reflecting? Oh, I came to preach. This is about to blow your mind. Why would they cut to the faces of the family? Because they are no longer reflecting the old house. You can see the new house on their faces. So if you're not your gift, come on somebody, if you're not your guilt, then you are to reflect the glory of God so that when the camera pans to you, I don't just see you, I see the glory of God reflecting on your face. So when the devil tries to attack you, you say, not today, Satan, I got the glory of God shining on my face. When the devil tries to get you and your wife to go sideways, I came to tell you today, you don't have to reflect who you used to be, you can reflect who you are. Why do they show the faces? Because it's the glory of the house. I don't need to see the house in order to see the house. I can see the house on their faces. I can see the house on their faces. You are not your gift. You are not your guilt. You are called to reflect God's glory. Would you stand to your feet all across this room? You are not your gift, sir, who's been successful. I'm proud of you. I'm glad you did that. I'm glad you've made all that money. That's so awesome. I think it's great. Thank you for financing the kingdom, but that's not who you are. Sir, who has a past, you are not your guilt. I know, you, I know you feel like your past is prohibiting you from your future. I know like your record is keeping you from righteousness, but I wanna let you know today that all of your sins, past and present, have been forgiven on the cross and you can walk out of here today reflecting God's glory. I love you dearly. I love you dearly, all of you. And if we were to become men whose identity was not wrapped up in our bucket and not wrapped up in our past, then we could say, we are true sons of God with real identities that are not contingent upon what we do, 
or what we've done. Would you bow your heads all across this room? You say, Pastor Mike, thank you for that word. That was a great word. Thank you for coming from Raleigh, North Carolina to share that word with me. And that's what I needed to hear. I need to reflect God's glory. I need to reflect God's glory. I need to reflect God's glory. I wanna reflect God's glory more. I wanna be a reflection of God's glory. I don't wanna be a reflection of my gift and I don't wanna be a reflection of my guilt. I wanna reflect God's glory. If that's you today at the sound of my voice, would you just shoot your hand up in the air? You say, that's me, I wanna reflect God's glory. I wanna reflect God's glory. Hands everywhere, hands everywhere. I wanna reflect God's glory. I wanna reflect God's glory. I wanna pray for you today. If your hand is raised, make your way to the front right now. Make your way to the front right now. Let's close this thing out in prayer. I know you've been doing the, the altar call thing every single session, but there's something about moving. There's something about saying yes. This is your time. This is your moment right now. Before you leave, before you go back home, you're gonna reflect God's glory. And the mantle that is on you is greater than anything you've done and greater than anything you do. This is the glory of God shining on your face. Make your way from the balcony. Make your way all the way down. Make some room. Come on up, come on up, come on up. Make some room for these guys that are filling the altars right now. Make some room. I'm gonna pray for every single one of you. I'll miss my flight if I have to. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Make your way. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Come on, come on, come on. You are not your gift and you are not your guilt today. You are not your gift and you are not your guilt. Child of God, son of God, destined for greatness. Son of God, destined for greatness. Son of God, no matter what you've done, no matter what you do, destined for greatness in Jesus' name. May the glory of God be reflective on your faces. May the glory of God shine in every room that you go to, in every cubicle that you have, a, have to work in, in everything that you do. May it be the glory of God that shines on your face. This, the band is gonna play. I want you to stretch your hands forth. I'm gonna make my way through the altar as much as I possibly can. And we're just gonna sing this thing out and then I'll invite whoever's coming up to, to close us out. But I just wanna let you know before I get off this microphone, you are not your gift and you are not your guilt. You are to reflect God's glory in Jesus' name. Let's lift our hands, let's worship. The Mentor Guy's final thought. What a powerful word from Mike. I love when he said, too many can't move forward because they're so busy living in the past. You are not what you do. You're not what you've done. You are a child of God. What a great quote. And I really hope this word encouraged you and challenged you today to get your identity from God. Well, guys, as we wrap up today, I want to thank you for giving your time today to listen. I would love it if you took a second and shared this podcast to your social media accounts. We'd love to be able to reach even more men and help them grow in their walk with God. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to visit MentorMysteries.com to check out our conferences, the dates, locations, the speakers. You can also find out about our books and resources. You can read the first chapter of most of our books for free at MentorMysteries.com. You can order the rest of the book from the website. Guys, make sure you attend your local Mentor conferences. As we get going with our 2022 Ignition Mentor conferences, you do not want to miss it. But guys, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week on the Mentor Guy podcast. Thanks for listening to the Mantor Guy podcast. Be sure to visit MantorMinistries.com to learn more about our books, men's ministry resources, and our Mantor conferences. Hey guys, Mantor Guy, Jamie Holden here. Are you looking for a speaker at your church or for your men's breakfast, or your next men's event, men's retreat, or men's conference? Well, why not bring me in to speak? God has been moving among men as I've been sharing an encouraging word of freedom and victory. We're seeing lives change, men being saved, people being set free, and guys, chains are being broken. So if your church has hurting men and women, contact me to come share this encouraging word of hope and victory to help you grow in your walk with God. The Mentor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God.